Danny, go ahead. Thank you for seeing you. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here and to participate in the great work that is coming out of um, um, DRM. Um, so, thanks for your hospitality. And um, as Sasha said today, I'm going to present some very recent work on Dante um, in modernism. So, Dante is ubiquitous in modernism for W.B. Yeats. Dante was the only poet capable of achieving unity of being. Well, Ezra Pound celebrated in 1910 the advent of what he called the master. T.S. Eliot, who for Pound was the true Dantescan voice of modernism, praised Dante's supernatural quality in the sacred wood and acclaimed him as a European in his famous Dante essay of 1929, an essay which Samuel Beckett judged to be insufferably condescending, restrained, and professorial. And after Joyce's Ulysses, and also after his work in progress, the initial title of Finnegan's Wake, Beckett himself crafted a kind of preposterously purgatorial Belacqua Shua. So he takes a character from Purgatorial 4, Belacqua, adds to it uh, an Irish surname, and starts playing with this figure, this purgatorial figure of Belacqua, throughout his over. And, you know, I wrote an entire book about that, so I'm not going to go into that now. But what is interesting is that in the early 20th century, engaging with Dante seems to become a necessity rather than an option for experimental writers, as Ezra Pound rather pugnaciously put it. No one, he writes, who's unprepared to train himself in his art by comparative study of the culture today accessible in the spirit of the author of the Vulgari Eloquio, Dante, can be expected to be taken seriously. Now, after Eliot and Pound, the critical danger today is to remain stuck in a cycle of reverential repetitiousness. You know, the story, you know, the kind of familiar story goes something like in the early 20th century, Dante was the true European, the supernatural master, the linguistic experimental exemplum, both the supreme craftsman and also in a Joycean sense, the old artificer. And critics today seem to be called to either admire the operation of incorporation or subversion that took place in the literature of the period, or to look up to Dante as a sort of founder of civilizations. What I hope instead to do today is to give you quite a different story of the presence of the 14th century Italian writer in uh, modernism. I will begin with an impossible project, um, Giuseppe Terragni's unbuilt Danteum, which was supposed to be a kind of celebration of um, the Divine Comedy itself, but of the work of Dante in general. Uh, both a kind of temple, a library, a museum, and I'm going to tell you more about that. So from this impossible project, I will move um, towards a rather bewildering use of the Dantean allegor allegory of the Gryphon at the end of Purgatorio in Gina Barnes's late play, The Antiphone. And I will conclude by looking back to an almost completely unknown use of Dante by Dorothy Richardson, author of Pilgrimage, and I'm going to focus on one novel um, that is part of this series called Interim. And so I'm basically going to move from you know, the late 30s uh, to the post-war 1958, this play, and then back in time to 1919. So what I hope to give you today is a rather unfamiliar uh, picture of Dante. And I might, but only occasionally, uh, refer to Pound, Beckett, and Eliot. So my overall contention is that although it is beyond question that Dante is a central presence in modernist aesthetics, readings of these presence have been straight-jacketed by what I would like to call here a sort of uh, model of male patronage. Okay, so this model of male patronage seems to have been the only way in which Dante's presence in modernism has been read so far. And my argument here is that it is an incredibly limiting way of um, thinking about it. So by looking at it, hopefully, you know, what would be different, um, different um, 
you know, ways in which Dante is made part of both an aesthetic and a political narrative in the early 20th century, I hope to indicate possible alternative avenues of research. So let's start with this uh, Danteum, Terrani. Uh, now, Terrani is especially famous as a rationalist Italian architect, architect who you know, worked especially in the 30s, late 20s and 30s. Probably his most famous um, building is La Casa del Fascio, so the fascist house, which is a, a, a very experimental, uh, extremely... Um, uh, a, a building that is very, very influenced by international modernism at that point. Now, the Danteum instead is paper architecture. It's an example of an appropriation of a rationalist appropriation of Dante that is also, in the words of Le Corbusier, the work of an architect. It's a plastic translation of the Divine Comedy into a monumental experience of transformation. So the project was initially conceived by Vino Valdemari, who was a Milanese lawyer and the director of the Brera Academy. And he had the financial backing of Alessandro Pappos account, who uh, was prepared to give two million euros of the time, so it's a humongous amount of money towards the construction. It was presented in 1938, bearing both signatures um, by Giuseppe Terrani and also um, Pietro Lingeri, and was enthusiastically approved by Mussolini. So it was planned to emerge in front of the Basilica di Massenzio, so you can see it there, the ruin there, uh, on the Via dell'Impero, next to the Colosseo. So it was literally in a Palazzo Venezia, which was you know, Mussolini's residence, then there was a Danteum, then there was a Colosseum, in the middle, the Basilica di Massenzio. So Via, de, Via dell'Impero is what is now Via dei Fori Imperiali, you know, so that big sort of um, fascist dream of uh, progression, and this is where the Dante um, should have um, been built. The outbreak of the war put an end to the monumental plan, which was in fact already dead by about May 1939. And Terani himself, who was 34 year old when um, he drew up this um, uh, project, uh, died in Como in 1943 after having been to the Russian front as an enthusiastic supporter of. Um, you know, of um, Mussolini. So, uh, to describe a little bit in more detail this building, um, Arati Kanekar in the Journal of Architecture describes it as such, and I think it's quite, it's quite a clear description. So, the, the existing drawings reveal a deceptively simple box-like building whose plan is organized in four parts. An entrance court open to the sky, adjacent to it an area, uh, so this is the entrance court, adjacent to it an area with a dense regular grid of columns. This is the, the thicket, the forest at the beginning of um, the Divine Comedy. Um, this empty space is actually described in the Relazione, so in the kind of supporting uh, description by Terani himself as a conscious waste of building space and yet signifying the fact that when you go in you're a bit lost, you don't know where to go. So you know we're sort of like reproducing the experience of Dante the program. And uh, on the one side of this space is two rooms representing the inferno and the purgatorio that I will tell you, I'll show you in a moment. And on the second floor, paradise, divided into paradise proper and the room of the empire. Hmm? And so these are the watercolors that we have in addition to the drawings, in addition to this relazione, which Terani really thinks can have the sort of function that the, the, the epistle to Can Grande has in Dante's own uh, work. Mm? So it's a kind of supplementary explanation of what this building is supposed to be doing. The uh, Relazione tells us that the round form was discarded because the area it encloses is too modest for what was needed, but also because of the immediacy of potential conflict with a perfect and imposing ellipse of the Colosseum. Okay, so you can see the ellipse there and the way in which the, this shape wants to really break that. Now, the shape, we, we could say, that informs the whole building is the golden section rectangle, okay? So the distinctive feature of this shape is that when you take away a square section of the same, you know, with a, you know, with a short side, the remainder is another golden section rectangle. So the same aspect ratio 
it, you know, is kept. And it's linked in the relation, it is, you know, called the section rectangle, is linked in the relation to monumentality and to classicism. It's also the only shape, Gerani tells us, that clearly expresses the harmonic law of unity in Trinity, and as such, enables an interpretation of the comedy as an opera numerica, a work of numbers. So the main preoccupations is an idea of grafting onto geometric schemes for the monument from the very beginning, what they call meaning, myths, and commonly held symbols as a spiritual synthesis. And in the case of Dutta's work, they said, the yeah, Thorani says, these are evidently numerical meanings. Okay? So the Relazione presents the building as a fatto plastico di valore assoluto, a plastic event of absolute value. Right? Um, in addition to this numerical translation, what is crucial to the project is the fact that such a rectangle can be decomposed into squares, you know, infinitely. Mm? So what you have, if you keep kind of chopping it up, you have this perfect golden spiral. And this is the spiral that produces, for instance, the inferno here, where the columns seem to be scattered around the room, but actually follow the golden spiral. Okay? Um, and well, interestingly, what the Relazione says is that if the Dantesque Inferno, for instance, were to be plastically delineated by a series of diminishing rings in the form of a funnel, ending in the vertex of the devil, with the intervals, jumps, bridges, rivers, etc., so admirably described by the divine poet, this would almost certainly not create an exciting effect because the presentation would be too literal a version of Dante's description. Okay, so what we have is a sort of, if you like, Poundian translation, which takes, you know, exciting liberties, we could say, with the text in order to remain faithful to a particular spirit located in the Divine Comedy itself. A translation that wants to obtain what they call the maximum of expression with the minimum of rhetoric, the maximum of emotion with the minimum of decorative and symbolic adjectives. Mm. So um, the building is recognized as having an eminently didactic quality and to want, you know, aiming at being a living work and not a labor of erudition, nor the fantasy of a theatrical producer. So there is a kind of resistance against theatricality. And yet the building must produce astonishment. So for instance, the inferno is supposed to communicate a catastrophic sensation of pain and useless aspiration to gain the sun and light, its columns appearing disorganized in their arrangement, extremely heavy marble columns. The Purgatorio you know, expresses immediately the kind of hope of, you know, through that open access to the sky. The viewer of this building is imagined as a pilgrim. There, you know, it's imagined to kind of proceed in a single line, you know, throughout the building and experience um, uh, this, you know, experience the you know, spatially experience the comedy rather than uh, seeing analogies with the text. And this is where things become extremely interesting, of course, is the Paradiso, where the columns are exclusively made of glass. So above the inferno, you, you have this entire room made of glass columns. So it's a, it's a real, you know, the project is really basically a staging of the column as an architectural um, shape. Um, Paradiso, however, is divided into two rooms. You have this almost kind of transubstantiations into transparency here, um, you know, but you also have the Empire Room, which is, you know, perhaps the most clear, um, clearly, you know, uh, the room that most clearly uh, describes its fa fascist association, mm -hmm. Imperial Rome, so the Divine Comedy read as a, you know, as a, model for imperial um, conquest, really, um, uh, with the And the pilgrim finally descends mm, from this um, room of the empire down some steps and is confronted with uh, a cube of marble that stands for what in the Divine Comedy is the Velto, so the Greyhound, which symbolically stands for the emperor that will save Italy by invading it, and at this point stands for you know, the fascist Duce Mussolini with a big M at the end. Okay? So what you have here is 
you know, how you know, the downtown here shows us both the aesthetic attraction and the political dangers of monumentality. It demonstrates uh, and, and can, can produces an answer to the question of how, how something between a tomb and a temple can make the Divine Comedy remain alive. The crystalline purity of its upper level, which clearly links also the fascist revolution with the rationalist architectural revolution, creates a divine comedy who's out of, which is out of reach but can still be experienced. So, and this is of course a way that we can also read this project as engaging with an idea of a life that can be lived you know, temporarily in the everyday, but also substantial eternitatis, you know, sort of like in a, in a sort of more spirit, on a more spiritual level. And if we think about a certain Eliot, um, perhaps Eliot's double vision in four quarters, or if you think about the kind of the crystalline purity towards which some of the late Poundian cantos aspire to, that you know, you can see similarities there. Now, what this uh, building very vocally is not is the kind of fascist Dante that is promoted by uh, writers, for instance, such as Papini. Uh, Giuseppe Papini, who in 1933 writes uh, Dante Vivo, Dante Alive, uh, a book that is utterly despised by Samuel Beckett, who writes um, the purpose of this marginality. He writes uh, a view in 1934, which is now printed in the volume Disjecta, if you're interested. There are some kind of quite uh, quite uh, vitriolic reviews that are very amusing there. Uh, you know, this is what Papini gets from Beckett. The purpose of this marginalia would be the reduction of Dante to lovable proportions. Okay, this Dante alive and lo lovable proportions. But who wants to love Dante? We want to read Dante. For example, his imperishable reference in the Paolo Francesca episode to the incompatibility of the two operations. Okay, quel giorno più non leggemo avanti, you know, when Paolo Francesca fall in love. You know, the reading stops and the love starts. So that's the reference there. Okay, so what we have here is in Terani, the translation of the comedy into an imperialist and monumental, you know, opera numerica, work of numbers, is also a way of disavowing the loss that monumentality necessarily entails. In other words, Dante is lost, is lost to, you know, in a past that is not retrievable, but he can be found reincarnated in the fascist ideal. The pilgrim to the Danteum is temporarily lost, but he can be restored to the transparency of the fascist house of glass. Okay, so it's it's you know this kind of uh, very complicated um, clashing of aesthetic purity, which has of course a long legacy in the history of architecture. And if you think even about something like Lieberskin's Jewish Museum in, and the kind of experience of space that one can have there, a lot of architects have actually you know, drawn to Tarani Danteum as one of the, you know, um, paradoxically, one of the models there. Um, and at the same time, this kind of disavowal of what are the problems with not monumentality, how monumentality wants to, if you like, sort of you know, paper over the gaps that that loss entails. And that is what I'm particularly interested here in, you know, reading this project with you uh, because of my second um, example, um, the example of Juna Barnes. So we move from paper architecture to cabinet drama, so to an unbuilt edifice to uh, an unperformed uh, play. Uh, from transparency, there you go, again, to a very peculiar form of opacity in Juno Brown's work, from symbol to allegory. So from Terani to Juno Barnes's, from Terani's imperial rationalism, we could say, to Juno Barnes's improper modernism. Now, uh, I'm sure that you know, some of you will be familiar with, uh, with Juno Barnes and her over, but I'll just you know, give a tiny bit of, a, of an introduction with a focus on, on Dante as well. Now, T.S. Eliot, in a <coughs> desolate, desolate letter of 1944, admits to finding Juno Barnes's play, The Antiphone, very, very obscure. Right? So this, this is Eliot reading Barnes and saying, I really don't get it, you know, it's just too hard for me, it's too difficult, I can't do it. And it's only because of Edwin Muir, another very important um, champion of modernist <coughs> literature, 
um, the, the Scottish critic, um, that um, the play eventually is published in 1958. Now, um, you know, I'm quoting Eliot here because he epitomizes what would become a lasting attitude towards her work. Barnes, Gina Barnes has been portrayed as the attractive, mysterious, sexually daring American expatriate who led the glamorous bohemian life of Greenwich Village and Paris from the mid-tens to uh, the late thirties. Okay, so often portrayed as an eccentric character, she's said to have produced a masterpiece, her novel Nightwood, published in 1936, also by Faber and Faber. Uh, with a very famous introduction by T.S. Eliot to the American 1937 edition that really praised the book and made it into a modernist classic, if you like. Uh, but also, you know, after pr producing this masterpiece, she's often, you know, her life is often recounted as uh, a sort of, you know, surviving her previous mythical self as a hermit in a studio um, flat in Greenwich Village until her death, which. Um, took place very, very late, like Beckett. Um, she almost spans the entire century, so she dies in 1982. And of course, this kind of slightly caricatural version of Juno Brown's that I'm proposing here is being challenged. Um, I've challenged it myself. Uh, there is a, a new book coming out on her called uh, Shattered um, um, Objects, Juno Brown's Modernism. It's coming out later uh, this year, perhaps early um, 17, um, edited by um, Elizabeth Pender and Catherine Sets. Uh, now, there is ample evidence of Barnes' knowledge of Dante. She owned the Temple Classic editions of the comedy, but also the Canzoni in the Vita Nuova. But the, in her library, the edition that is carefully annotated is the Carlyle Wicksteed translation of the comedy published in 1932 by Random House. And there is a kind of liberal sprinkling, if you like, of Dante references in the Barnes over. You know, so for instance, in um, a 1928 novel called Rider, and I, you know, if you haven't read it, go and read it. It's a, a real, really sort of mad, a wonderful, picaresque uh, novel. Uh, you have the picture of Dante uh, smiling forlornly, you know, on this uh, palimpsestic wall. Sophia Ryder has this wall that is absolutely plastered with images that go from, um, you know, Dante and you know, images from the Bible, but also, you know. Um, very popular and quite lurid images and everything is pasted on top of each other and all these figures are said to almost kind of know in advance they will, they will be eventually be submerged by the passing of time and history. So we have Dante there. Dante also appears in, uh, in Nightwood where one of the main characters, Dr. O'Connor, is called Dr. Matthew, Matthew Mighty Grain of Salt. Dante O'Connor. Okay, so you even have that kind of fabulation in you know, attached to Dante um, uh, in one of the main characters of uh, Nightwood. Uh, <coughs> Juno Barnes also picks up on the use that um, T. S. Eliot makes of um, the past part is called Undone, mm -hmm. you know, in Italian the disfatti that appears in Inferno Three. Um, and that he uses famously in uh, uh, The Wasteland, and she uses it in a poem that she writes for Eliot, uh, for Eliot's 70th birthday. Okay, so there are kind of lots of moments where we can think about Dante's presence in Juno Barnes. Um, but what I want to really do now is to um, think about um, the antiphone. Okay, so we said published after much discussion in 1958. Uh, the only stage production that this play ever enjoyed was at the Royal um, uh, uh, Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm <laughs> in a Swedish translation because Dag Hammarskjöld, who was at that point Secretary General to the United Nations in the States, mm -hmm. became absolutely enamored with Juno Bass's work, had it trans well, translated it himself with um, uh, um, Karl Ragnar Gilf, and you know, they put it, you know, they made a big splash and they, you know, they put it on stage at the Royal Dramaten in Stockholm uh, in 61. And that is the first and only time that this play has actually seen life, aside from a previous um, kind of uh, 
directed reading at Harvard that uh, Barnes herself attended, sitting between T.S. Eliot and Edwin Muir, sitting you know next to I.A. Richards, and absolutely hated them. She kind of stormed out, saying that you know Augusta was far too fat, and she didn't like that at all. You know, Juno Barnes is a very hard person to please. Okay, uh, now. Uh, so, you know, we have basically this aborted semi-staging and then we have, you know, one staging in, trans in Swedish translation that actually got good reviews but then, you know, was probably kind of dead in the water. Newer tried to convince her that it could work really as a radio play. Elliot was never really persuaded by um, the, you know, the play. It was kind of left there. Okay. Now, it's very interesting. It's in loose iambic pentameter, so it's kind of Shakespeareanly written, again, totally um, anachronistically, but set in 1939. Okay, so and what you have throughout the play is this incredibly strange clashing of registers that go from, you know, the Jacobean revenge tragedy, for instance, um, the you know Middleton's revenge tragedy um, is probably the biggest source here. Uh, together with American slang, nursery rhymes, everything is made, you know, to clash, as you will see for a moment. Uh, in a moment, um, it's it's also, as the title uh, indicates, a liturgical response to the earlier picaresque novel writer. They are both stories about family and revenge. And um, now, against uh, modernist proclivity towards what. Samuel Beckett called phrase bombs, so they come from Dante, you know, the whole, the kind of like pithy, quotable line. Barnes goes in a completely different direction. She goes for allegory. So she goes for the kind of Dante that most modernist writers at this point are utterly disinterested in. Mm -hmm. And uh, she takes the allegory of uh, the Gryphon that we find basically at the end of Purgatorio, from Purgatorio 29 to 32, so this beast that is, you know, a kind of obviously sort of like a fantastic beast that carries, you know, this big carriage, the procession, and you know, at the ends of Purgatorio, and you know, if you remember those um, those cantos, there are also those cantos where Dante is very openly drawing on Saint John's in terms of and Ezekiel in terms of writings of the apocalypse okay so it's it's an apocalyptic context you could say it's a context of metamorphosis the gryphon stops and then there is this kind of fantastic metamorphosing of the carriage that is attacked from various kind of animals and there is an element of monstrosity so all these three elements that are present at the end of purgatorio are of great interest um, to barnes and you know become absolutely central here but the gryphon becomes in this play a stage prop and also part of the stage set. Okay, so the three acts are quite static, they share the same setting, and the proscenium has on both sides wide, shallow steps leading to the gallery. Under the gallery there is a large <coughs> doorway, but without a door. To the left there is a Gothic window, but again a painless one, and to the right, through what she calls tumbled wool, country can be seen and part of a ruined colonnade. Okay? And then in the hall proper, a long table with a single settle facing front, at either end of which is set the half of a gryphon, once a car in a roundabout. Okay? So you have this stage prop, which is also part of the stage set, which is a kind of lost object that used to have a different function in a fanfare, in a roundabout in a fanfare, divided, that sits there on stage and comes together at the end. So here um, Augusta tells her daughter Miranda, you are unfit for stumbling conformity, and wonderfully is man-made counterfeit. Therefore, when you have stopped, return and help me make of this divided beast an undivided be bed. Okay, this is act two. So this is, you know, the beast that you know dazzles Dante. You know, where Bertuccia is, and you know, before she reproaches him, this monstrosity, uh, the monstrosity of the Dantean pageant, um, marks the end of the pilgrim ascent, the beginning of the beatific visions of paradise. Barnes's Gryphon is similarly apocalyptic, but is a solid beast, an excellent stage 
fit for a play. That's how Act Three puts it. And it's on this you know, excellent beast, the final um, tragedy of um, this play um, takes place. Mm -hmm. So you have a kind of allegorical figure, but you have its popular previous life you know, on, you know, in the fanfare context. And you, know, you have this kind of queering of an absolute object into uh, a place where the tragic circularity is acted out. Okay? And this is, this is what happens. Um, Augusta, at this point, towards the end of the play, is really using her daughter as a sort of sexualized fantasy of her lost past. Everything that she could have done and cannot do. So the gripe on the stage becomes a way in which she's projecting these, um, these ideas, what they could still be doing. Uh, I think that Gryphon moved. We have a carriage. Let's go to Ostend, Monte Carlo, Brighton, the Lido, Palm Beach, Breisgau, Carcassonne. And don't forget the flares and the chandeliers, the pleasure gardens, Vauxhall, Fountain Bleu, the Trianon, the fountains, and the music. And Miranda is constantly saying no to anything that her mother is trying to project. No fountains, no flambeau, no music, or no gallons. Then why did you let me grow so old? and then let them get away, the other brothers. And Jeremy, you are to blame, to blame, you are to blame. Lost, 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 lost. And it's the very end of the play, when Augusta brings the bell down on Miranda, there's a kind of you know, heavy metal bell, both fall across the gryphon, pulling down the curtains, get crown and all, and then the ringing ceases. Burley appears on the balcony, who's another character I'm not telling you about, but can later if you're interested, and then um, Jack turns from the fallen portion of the wall. That's the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is this really interesting way in which a Dantean allegory becomes both, uh, you know, the bed where there is supposed to be a kind of, uh, is the, the death scene, the death bed, but it's also, you know, the, the place where the mother is trying to uh, ask her daughter to give birth to her to regenerate her. Um, so it's, it's you know, very much part of um, a play that says to be taking place when everything is a little out of context. Mm -hmm. So if you like, Dante is part of um, a play that we could say with Walter Benjamin, blast the epoch out of the reified continuity of history and explodes its homogeneity interspersing it with ruins, that is to say, as Benjamin puts it, with the presence. So it embodies the anachronism that this play stages very, very much. Okay, so if Derani's architectural temple of the, to the Divine Comedy wanted to rationally avoid theatricality, annul the loss brought by the passing of time, Barnes' ornate play in fact, exhibits, often bombastically, its melancholic attachment to loss. So we have this absolute opposite way of dealing with Dante as a lost object, if you like. Now let me give you my third um, case study of this uh, rather unusual Dante, you know, modernist Dante, and this is Dorothy Richardson. So again, Dorothy Richardson, uh, you know, one of the you know, absolutely crucial figures in modernism, the very definition stream of consciousness, you may, you know, a definition she hated, by the way, but was generated as a response to her work um, in a review in, in 1916 by May Sinclair, where she said, Dorothy Richardson is finding an absolutely new way of narrating, it's a stream of consciousness. Yeah, and then that, that um, you know, um, definition, that label, as you know, kind of stuck. So, you know, very, very important. She writes a, a, a novel series, 13 volumes between 1915 and 1938, with one last volume published posthumously. And these volumes narrate in free and direct discourse the life of Miriam Henderson between the age of 17 and um, her late 30s. Okay? Now, first of all, we have, of course, Pilgrimage, that very title, which could be reconducted to a kind of Christian notion of progression, and of course, um, to Dante, but, but there are lots of references in these various novels, also to um, John Bunyan, so in The Pilgrim's Progress. So um, it's, it's not exclusively a Dantean um, reference. Uh, in Interim, which is the novel set in 1919, which was published in installment in, uh, um, together with Joyce's um, um, Ulysses, 
<coughs> in the literature review. So you had these wonderful numbers that you can easily access online when you have bits of intern followed by uh, bits of Ulysses. Um, uh, in this, in this particular uh, novel, and I want to focus on, on this aspect, Miriam travels out of central London and goes to a Dante lecture in some unspecified in the novel uh, northern suburb, uh, which we can easily reconstruct as being West Hampstead, basically, and she goes to this, to this lecture. So apologies for the very uh, long quotation. Um, if you've read any Dorothy Richardson, the problem is always when to stop. Is this precise? Is this kind of absolutely unstoppable flow? Uh, and so I just want to pick up on a few, few things here. She could see that when he read the sonnets, so this is about Miriam thinking about the lecturer who's just finished the lecture, and then he reads out some of uh, the, um, the Vitanova sonnets. He forgot how learned he was. The little lecture had had its own fascination, but it was a lecture, something told by a specialist to an audience. This was Dante's voice, and they all listened as they could, the lecturer as well. All his knowledge was put aside and he listened as he read. She sat listening, her shocked mind still condemning her for not having discovered for herself that it was wrong to have a post office savings account and that betting and gambling and lotteries were wrong because they produced nothing. For a time she flashed about with a searchlight of this new definition of vice. Money can't produce money. Then all trade was wrong in some way. Dissipation of value without production. There was some principle that all civilization was breaking. How did this man know that it was wrong to imagine affection if there was not affection in your life, that dreaming and brooding was a sort of beastliness? Love was actual and practical, moving all the spheres and informing the mind. That was true. That was the truth about everything. But who could attain it? Dante knew it because he loved Beatrice. Dante only saw it, but this is the awful truth, however one may sit, as if one were not condemned, and forget again. This is the difficult thing that everyone has to do, not dogmas. This man believes that there is a God who loves and demands that men shall be loving. The humble, yearning, the version, and the voice, reading the lines, made it a prayer, the very voice a prayer to a spirit waiting all around, present in himself, in everyone listening in the very atmosphere. It was there to be had, it was like something left far behind, on a dark road, and still there, to be had for the asking, to be had by merely turning towards it. She looked into the eyes of Dante, across the centuries, as into the eyes of a friend. But then these people were the same, was the truth about everybody, the goodwill and all us. So Dante becomes here the source of moral thoughts against the backdrop of modern capitalism, informed by Miriam's own worry of being a fraud her thinking of gambling and lotteries as vice, her speaking of beastliness. beastliness. Okay, now you can hear probably the um, echoes here of you know, two, two cantos of the Inferno, um, you know, the sixth and the seventh circle really, so Inferno 11, the canto in which the heretics are punished and which speaks of fraud and of beastliness, uh, and also Inferno 16 and 17, okay, when we have uh, fraud and uh, a loss uh, in trust. I'm going to give you Singleton's translation that you can follow here on, um, on the screen and I'm going to read the Italian. Um, this is from Inferno 11, right? Just to give you a sense of how fraud, business and uh, moral preoccupations inform this passage. La fraude on the crescenza e morsa può l'omusare in cui con un fida e in quel che fidanza non in borsa. Questo modo di reto per chi incida fu lo vinco d'amore che fa natura. Onde nel cerchio secondo s'annida ipocrisia, lusinghe e chiaffattura, falsità, ladroneggio e simonia, ruffian, baratti e simile lordura. Non ti rimembra di quelle parole con le quali la tua etica per tratta le tre disposizioni che il ciel non vuole, incontinenza, malizia e la matta bestialità. E come incontinenza men di offende e men biasimo a catta. Okay, so we have the problem of trust here. Mm -hmm. uh, in Inferno we meet Gerion, the beast of fraud, wonderful creature which swims up and then down again from Malibolge, um, who affects Dante's own uh, trustworthiness. You know, Dante, after seeing Gerion, kept saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak words that will sound like a lie. So even my own truth will sound like a lie after he's been kind of almost infected by this creature, which is also especially deceiving because he has the face of a wise man and then this quirking-like 
uh, ornate, attractive and yet repulsive um, um, body. And is within the context of un, you know, untrustworthiness and fraud that Miriam is thinking about um, kind of specific late 19th century moral imperatives. But we could say that perhaps this kind of Dante, you know, a Dante, you know, uh, that calls for lived Christianity and prayer, uh, you know, could simply point to a sort of late Victorian commitment to theology. You know, after all, Interim, although it was published in 1919, is set in 1896 to 98. So it is really set, you know, the, the novel is really set at that particular point in history. In fact, we could say, as uh, a critic, and you have to love these early responses to women modernist writers, it could just be a Dante that is a little pinched and sour and old maidish, okay? which is one of the things that one of the reviewers said about um, this novel. But I think it's incredibly important to understand Dorothy Richardson's aesthetics. You know, Dante can really, really teach us something about this. Because, for instance, if you think about a poet like David Jones, David Jones um, theorizes the move between late Victorian times and modernism as a Dantean Styx. You know, he says, you know, it is the Styx that is completely, you know, is, is, is that gulf that separates modernism from late Victorian, um, uh, from late Victorian aesthetics. But pilgrimage tries to precisely throw a bridge between this formally and politically um, uh, ruptured in a period. So there is this bridge that is being cast by interim, and I think this is absolutely specific to Richardson aesthetics. She's one of the very, very few modernists that actually wants to theorize a continuity between late Victorian times and, um, um, and modernism. So refusing, if you like, uh, a notion of modernism as a break with a tradition-bound past. The other very, very important thing to, um, uh, to think about here is that this moral thinking is really steeped in uh, a political and economical framework. Now, George Thompson, for instance, has picked up on the fact that the lecturer that remains unnamed in the novel is very probably Philip Wicksteed. If you remember, I was mentioning him a moment ago because he's a very, very important translator in England of the Divine Comedy. Wicksteed was an incredibly interesting uh, person. He was uh, at the the earliest translator of the work of Ibsen, for instance, into English. Uh, he also spoke fluent Dutch and he uh, translated quite a lot of theological writings from Dutch into, um, into English. He was a political economist who wrote uh, incredibly popular treatises on, on political economy, like the A to Z to political economy um, in 1910. And, uh, and at the same time, he was one of the greatest Dante scholars. He was a non-conformist um, uh, Protestant, so he was, he was a Unitarian minister. And he had these lectures that he used to give um, in Little Portland Street Chapel in London, which eventually he wrote up and published under the title um, Dante Six Sermons, which was a huge bestseller in you know um, the late um, 19th century, and uh, and you know went through you know infinite reprints and was an absolute essential text to trace back the um, reception of Dante in English, uh, in English culture. Interestingly, he was never also accepted in the official Dante clubs. So he was never part of the Dante Society of Oxford or London, and he used to kind of you know, preach to sections of the populations that would normally not have access to university education. So for instance, he's very much behind the um, extension movement in, um, in, in England. And you can see from, from this, from the appendix to the six sermons that I've just put up, how himself um, you know, produces an, a staunchly non-conformist and non-doctrinal Dante, which certainly resonates with the Dante encountered in Interim. But in Richardson, this Dante is also part of a non-hierarchical, non-dogmatic form of prayer. So Dante almost becomes a Quaker, you know, he becomes a friend, literally. So it's a, it's a much more Quaker Dante than a um, Unitarian Dante, if you like. Um, so what seems particularly interesting here is that you have a, a moment where Dante is evoked but never quoted directly. Um, 
via a narrative that is steeped into late 19th century uh, political economy. Okay? Uh, Dante, very importantly, is never an authoritative source to be used, as the text put it, as a code or a weapon to crush someone. Dante instead contributes to shaping the novel's reluctance to transform literary precedents into measurable cultural value. So one of the things that interim and pilgrimage overall wants to avoid is to have previous authorities used in the text in order to increase the value of the text itself. There is a, a constant reluctance to use Dante as a value. Okay? So dissipation of value without production, we could say, words that produce capital by just being repeated. There is a you know, real rejection of that economics, if you like, of quotation and the economics of transmission that very often we tend to take for granted. And this is what um, is so interesting. And of course, it happens formally in, uh, in Richardson. So we literally do not have any direct quotations from the Divine Comedy or from the sonnets or from any of the, you know, Dante, you know, that we sort of kind of hear in the prose and yet is not there. Okay, so it's a particular, um, it's a kind of very accomplished disappearing act that she's putting out for us. Now, what is also important is that this reluctance to use um, previous authorities as a form of cultural value is also linked to gender. And here you can see how she's saying that you know, Milton and Dante's devils um, are actually a part of this male yelling in the dark, okay? So there is a kind of um, a real criticism of these uh, uh, despots, you know, this kind of um, um, Milton's devil better than his paradise, okay? Um, and, um, you know, it's very, very funny. It's because males, more specialized, less balanced, this is a physiological fact, less integrated than women, less capable both of suffering and of vicarious living by the sympathetic imagination, um, yell loudest and most effectively in darkness, okay? So there is a, an idea that of these kind of male authorities, Milton and Dante, yelling in the dark. Now, what interim does instead is whisper in the dusk, we could say. There is another moment where we see, we have access to Miriam's own bookshelf, right? And this is how it reads. There was still a pale light flowing into the dusk of the garret. It must only be about nine o'clock. The gas flared out, making a winter brilliance. Dante, six sermons. Kunin's Life of Dante. Gemma Donati, Gemma, busily making puddings in the world lit by the light of the mystic rose, swept away by the rush of words. A stout Italian woman, Gemma, bay a tree tree, they were bound to reach music. Okay? Now, what is very interesting here is that, okay, you have the quotation to Wicksteed life, you know, um, Dante's six sermons that I was just telling you about. And then you have The Life of Dante. Now, The Life of Dante was the English title under which um, Boccaccio's Trapatello in Laudem Dante was translated. And historically, there is an absolute peak between um, 1898 and 1910. There are about six or seven translations into English of the, the, the Trapatello. Uh, Kunin, however, who's mentioned here, is a Dutch theologian from Leiden, and he never uh, translated Dante. He was, however, one of the theological ma maestri, if you like, of Wicksteed himself. Okay, so there are two ways in which we can read this reference to Kunin. One could be to say, okay, we have a genealogical line. Wicksteed, the translator, and then Wicksteed's, you know, theological, you know, spiritual guide, Kunin. But that still doesn't explain why we have Kunz associated with life of Dante. Now, what is instead very interesting to discover is that Kuhn had a daughter, Wilhelmina Kuhn, who was a Dante specialist. And, uh, and uh, we don't have anything left written by her, but Frederica Bremen, in her Dutch translation of the comedy that was published in 1941, has a long introduction where she praises the enormous, um, you know, more enormously inspirational work of the Lenina Kuhn and uh, claims that Kuhn refused to put anything to paper because she had a very specific didactic way of translating, impromptu translating, when she was um, lecturing, according to the needs of the audience. 
So she always refused to put anything on paper because of this particularly supple or flexible or you know, indeterminate way in which she was approaching translation, which of course resonates beautifully with what is happening in Dorothy Richardson pilgrimage. So what we have is, is you know, if you like, this alternative um, non-genealogical line where Kuhn could also be a sort of Judith Shakespeare, you know, of, uh, you know, if you want to think in terms of Virginia Woolf's uh, Room of One's Own, a sort of, you know, invisible translator of Dante, which is only barely, you know, has a footnote in history thanks to another female translator of Dante into Dutch, and is just barely there, in the dusk, not yelling in the darkness, but just barely there as a possible alternative way of reading genealogical transmission. Okay, so let me just bring all of this um, to a close. So what you could gather is that I'm very interested in the economics and the politics of literary borrowings and translations, of a form of transmission that does not simply uh, sit comfortably within that kind of genealogical line of authority producing authority, if you like. My last uh, quotation here is from a letter of, from <coughs> Freud to Fleece from 1899, uh, when Fleece is critiquing uh, Freud's drafts towards um, uh, the dream book, the Tandeuter. Uh, Once again, Freud writes, you put into words what I had dimly been thinking to myself, that this first chapter is up to deter a lot of readers from going, going on to the following chapters, but there is still little to be done about it except for putting a note in the preface which we shall construct when everything else is done. The whole thing is planned on the model of an imaginary walk. First comes the dark wood of the authorities who cannot see the trees, where there is no clear view and it is easy to go astray. Then there is a cavernous defar through which I lead my readers, my specimen dream with its peculiarities its details, its indiscretions, and its bad jokes. And then, all at once, the high ground and the open prospect and the question, which way do you want to go? But now, for Teresa de la Reitis, this letter is firmly pre-interpretation of dreams, a, po a book that instead she calls the epic poem of modernity, and one in which the dark wood will never be left behind and the high ground for the high ground. After the dream book for De La Retis, the journey becomes interminable, reversible, discontinuous, intertextual. But I think that I want to tease out that discontinuity and this reversibility also from this letter already. There is something about this Freud as Virgil that is already self-sabotaging, not properly comedic, and yet quite jocular. I mean, think about the fact that the point of arrival, the high ground, is actually a point of departure, a question, a form of self-inquiry. Also think about, you know, in the translation of my song, cavernous defile, with this kind of, you know, the sexual and the geographical, if you like, rubbing against each other. And also the supposed objectivity of the specimen, which is, however, my specimen, and one characterized by bad jokes. So if you like, it, is, it already inscribes here a dialectical movement between one could say, again, borrowing from Samuel Beckett, going on and not knowing where one is. So in recording the tension between teleological progression and its disruption in Freud's Dantean letter to flies, uh, to fleas, sorry, we can become attuned to the ambivalence that characterizes Dante's presence in modernism. By doing so, we will avoid the classic critical move of folding back the fragmentariness of the subversion of the Dantean model into yet another form of value, yet another form of fidelity. So the Dante I've presented here does not necessarily increase the value of my author's literary stock, but makes us instead reconsider the economics of literary borrowings and translations, as well as posing the crucial question of what to do with those modernist authors such as Gina Barnes's and Dorothy Richardson's, in which Dante does not work as the master, the linguistic experimentalist, or the model for a European civilization. What we have perhaps uh, you know, gone through today is something similar to the disturbing traffic of uncanny familiarity, bad jokes, relentless self-questioning found in Freud's letter. Now that we have reached our open prospect, I'm left to ask after Freud, which way do you want to go? Thank you.